If women are the storytellers, what narratives are told? My voice is noise, is a whirlwind, is light, is dark. My voice is infinite comfort. So Women of Words Dorset is a project in which we have been working with local women who've experienced domestic abuse, or as I like to call it, male violence against women. Because it says exactly what's going on, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So we are working or have been working for the last eight weeks with these women in um, sessions to explore the voices and narratives and stories of women of Dorset's past, reflecting upon that, researching into that, and then um, bringing the, the question of if women are the storytellers, what narratives are told? And very much bringing that into their present day experience and what are the cultural stories that are being told, particularly around the female experience, and what do these women want to share, which is really, really exciting. A woman's voice is secondary. My voice is a runaway train, is an inconsistent something. My voice is an intermittent on, off something, a shifting weather front. It is not what I imagine. A master of disguise. My voice is often hesitant. My voice, an act of self-will. My voice is evolving. Part of the project is that there is this reclamation of not only um, the women um, reclaiming their voice or owning their voice and exploring their voice um, and their stories and the, the, the creative expression um, but there's also this sense of um, globally exploring well, what cultural narratives are we believing or have we been believing and um, what is it to, to um, speak out to create change and transformation through the stories that as writers the women create and share. Beautifully put. Thank you. Um, one of the groups of women um, that particularly um, interested the, the writers, our writers, um, were the women from Harrison Hospital. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about Harrison Hospital and the women there and what was discovered in the research of archive materials at Dorset History Centre? So Harrison Hospital was the local asylum that was towards Dorchester, out of the way, uh, so that nobody had to drive past it. Um, and recently, at the Dorset History Centre, the doctor's books or the archive material from mm, going back to 1860, and we, had, we were able to go and access the, the um, I think another name, medical the records? Me medical records of, um, of the past. And in some of the books, you get a very small black and white photograph of the patient and a little bit of information about her, where, where she's, her age, her name, her, you know, what might have happened, who might have brought her in to the asylum. And then you get the doctors and nurses notes about her, which, you know, gives us one perspective um, of, that, of that woman's experience through the eyes of someone who's observing and looking and trying to as a doctor work out how to how to help somebody i suppose but you know they became really interesting the the remarks that uh, that were made about the women it did seem quite a medicalized patriarchal gaze um the group's reflection um was that the women were secondary and um their voices were secondary and, and there was a, there didn't seem to be much respect in um, some of the comments. Comments. So, yeah. I'm sitting here by the small window, wondering about the world outside. I was there not so long ago. It's a desolate feeling of being completely alone, lost, and waiting to be found. 
I think of what was planned for me. Marriage, children, a life of being a good wife. But I've always felt that wasn't for me. There must be more. Is there? Martha Jane Fudge, 26, can read and write. Mania, simple, overwork. Charlotte Beatrice Armstrong, 27, married. Signs of excitement. Mania. Martha Fippard, 38, domestic servant, single. This woman laughs and smiles in a purposeless manner. I found it really interesting to think about you know, mental health, the health of a woman, the health of women from the past, thinking about the amount of work, um, the little understanding of how a woman's body functions from the past, um, the embarrassment about talking about a woman's body. Uh, so to look at to try and imagine some of their stories, because we don't get the whole picture. Elizabeth Ann Dormoni, 35. This patient menstruated last month and has already improved since. Most useful and much more cheerful. Rational, pleasant. Elizabeth Ann Dormoni, 19. Talks nonsense and willfully grimaces keeps rolling her eyes and gives one the idea of being mischievous. Minnie, 34. Supposed cause. Childbearing. Melancholia. A woman is a lioness. The woman is a protective lioness. A woman is a warrior. The woman is a brave warrior. A woman is a flower. The woman is a dancing flower. A woman is stardust. The woman is magical stardust. I can see the looks on their faces. Hearing me, but not listening. <laughs> Sometimes I laugh. Because then they lessen. I pull faces. And they are even more interested. And what would you say about the voices of the women of Harrison Hospital? Well, that's the sad thing, is that you don't hear the voice of the woman from Harrison Hospital, which is why I wanted to investigate them further. Um, and to work with the women that had been in refuge, to see if we could understand a little bit more about what they must have been thinking and feeling. My voice is my identity. My voice is a my identity. A woman's voice is an instrument. A woman's voice is an instrument. My voice is the world. My voice is the world. A woman's voice is secondary. A woman's voice is secondary. My voice is a sea sparkle bearer. My voice is a sea a sparkle voice bearer. Is a, a consoling woman's voice tool. is a consoling tool. A woman's voice is powerful. 
is a force, is a consoling tool. A woman's voice is a light, is a beacon of light, is, is a, a raging, raging roar. roar. I have so much inside of me wanting out. Sometimes I imagine running like the wind, galloping like a horse across plains of grass. It feels wonderful, thrilling. I want to stay there. We explored with the women uh, the embodied voice uh, using um, theatrical and holistic um, uh, uh, techniques to explore that. The, you know, the physicality and the sound of one's voice and the range of one's voice where we feel and sense that. Yeah, the vibrations, the lips, the chest, the belly for breath um, and the diaphragm for power and, yeah. Which frees up the creative voice as well and frees up the voice in the everyday. And the beauty of doing this in a group together, working individually but then being in a group together is that we also get to experience, or the group got to experience, um, and us too, what it is to be uh, in a, a collective field. Which was rather wonderful because to reflect back on one of the women that I wanted to share from the past, Lucy Minnie Baldock, who was one of the first suffragettes to be arrested and imprisoned. Um, the idea that she used her voice, standing up on platforms, calling out, shouting, rallying um, against all odds in some situations, um, felt like a, a you know a, a powerful connection to the past uh, and to, to to the now. I think the suffragettes are a really interesting you know, period of time because they were thought of as violent, the suffragettes, as um, terrorists. As soon as you say that word, we know that they put bombs in uh, post boxes, they set fire to homes of MPs that were stopping the bill from going forward. The bill for votes for women? Yeah. So when in the context of some voice, um, well, I think why, why does it get that extreme? Because for 50 years, the suffragists wanted a peaceful way of giving women the vote. You know, how much time, how long do we have to wait for something to change? Minnie Baldock was born in the East End of London and she was a, she saw around her the poverty and the way that women's lives were really hard. If you lost your husband, you lost your wage, you had children to bring up, dreadful conditions for housing, things don't change. Um, and so she was, uh, she wanted life to change for the poor and the only way to make that happen was to ensure that there was somebody who had power and could change the laws and that meant to give women the vote. If women were going to benefit, you know, it's a, um, how do you say that? If women can't vote, how do they have an influence? Yeah. If women don't have a voice, if their voice isn't heard, how do they have an influence? And yeah, that's kind of one of the things that we're exploring, power and privilege in, in the piece, I would say. So I always like to imagine her. I don't, you know, I can't speak to her, but we have got her letters that she wrote to her husband from prison. And in those letters, she talks about that she fights so that women's voices can be heard. And for me, that just says everything. She came to Dorset because she was very unwell. Um, her husband committed suicide and as I understand it, a piece of land in Hamworthy was purchased uh, to allow her to live out. She lived until she was in her 90s. A woman's voice is secondary. A woman's voice is secondary. A woman's voice is secondary. My voice is a sea sparkle bearer. My voice is a sea sparkle bearer. A woman's voice is, is a consoling tool.
I can hear birdsong outside. Sweet, soothing tune that makes me smile. The song seems to get louder, more cheerful and inviting. The bird sounds eager, persistent, like it is calling me. I spread out my arms and it feels wonderful to stretch them so wide. I can hear the bird song closer, so close. I feel impelled to go towards it. I stand on my bed, flapping my wings, grooming my feathers, preparing for flight. Without any more thought, I spread my wings and fly out the window. Women using their voices, women reclaiming their creative voices and um, saying what they want to say, sharing themselves, celebrating themselves and each other. Um, because the more that women do this, the richer this life is. Lady Annie Russellcote is uh, the only daughter of a rich mill owner came to Bournemouth with her husband who was very unwell and stayed in the Bath Hotel, decided to buy it. And with her royal connections, it became the Royal Bath Hotel and her husband then built her a house next door on Eastcliff in Bournemouth, which is now a museum. They, the two of them travelled all around the world and they collected souvenirs and artworks as well. Her father was really interested in art and so she was, she loved nature and uh, the house is just the most beautiful place to go and visit. It's surrounded with paintings and the house is painted and inspired by all her, all their travels. Is that her only legacy? Well, no, she was the second woman to be um, included in the Royal Literary Society. She was made a fellow because she wrote letters from all her travels to her daughter and they were they were published. They were published, I don't I think they're out of publication. But um, they're a real insight into Victorian travellers, the way the world was, the way she was thinking about the world that she was seeing, um, her relationship with her husband, her relationship with having enough money to be able to pay for anything that he needed, including guides and servants and so forth. And she, she is, from as far as I know, she didn't just use her money for travel, she used it for good within the local community as well. A philanthropist. Yeah, she, uh, after the First World War, if you are, if you know Constitution Hill in Poole, uh, at the bottom of the hill is uh, Lady Russell Coates house and they, she and her husband raised enough money with Bernardo's to purchase the land and to build a home for children. How is Annie Russell Coates' uh, story related to our project, Women of Words, and the women that we're working with who have experienced um, domestic violence, domestic abuse? Well, what I didn't know until this project was that Annie Russell Coates' daughter had a divorce in 1893. And if I just read some of the words from the divorce, we get commenced treating me with great unkindness and cruelty, was frequently drunk and violent, threatened me with violence, and did on one occasion threaten to shoot me. My voice is the world is a gem, is a journey. My voice is an opportunity. The women that were writing in the area, uh, you know, what are the voices that uh, we would be able to go and investigate and to explore? Uh, and on one hand, that's really exciting, but on the other hand, we have a knowledge that for the majority of women, writing and publishing your writing uh, isn't going to be something within their their realm, really. So there was, privilege was a factor mm -hmm. in terms of having access to education and um, even 
social standing uh, and um, space and respect to have your voice heard and, and to feel empowered to share it. Um, we have been working uh, in a weekly session with the women, uh, the, the women writers, and not only developing craft in terms of um, writing poetry and looking at uh, monologue and storytelling, you know, myths and folk, folk tales. We have also been working with the archive materials and the research there. And then in addition to that, we really wanted the element of the embodied voice. Um, what do so you mean by the embodied voice? That's a good question. By the embodied voice, um, an exploration of what it is, what is it to express the voice, um, not only creatively writing it down, but in the body, the felt sense of one's voice, and to know that it's not just here. There's an interplay with the psyche, you know, how we feel about our voices, so the embodied voice is how do we use the body as a resource to express what wants to move through us, what we want to share. And we used the idea of the voice as a, through poetry as well, didn't we? we sort of explored what the voice could be, uh, how, we would, how we relate our voice, um, created some really powerful poems. My voice is the world, is a gem, is a journey. My voice is an opportunity. My voice, an act of self-will. My voice is evolving. By reflecting on the past, we can see what's changed and what hasn't. We are individually and collectively responsible for choosing how we use our voice. And with awareness of the disparities of power and privilege, how can we actively create a culture in which all voices and experiences are valued. How can we live new narratives that benefit all, including the land that we live on? If women are the storytellers, what narratives are told? <laughs>